Can U.S. politicians strike a deal to avoid the sequester, which would trigger $85 billion in cuts this Friday? You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Hello, I'm Kimberly Halkett. Just two months on from the last major political showdown over the budget deficit, Washington's politicos are arguing over the potential impact of automatic budget cuts, which could hit on March the 1st. Now, the sequester was originally devised in 2011 to force Democrats and Republicans to strike a deal to cut the U.S. deficit. But both sides seem to be poles apart, with Republicans keen to reduce spending, while Democrats want to raise revenue by ending tax breaks for the wealthy. Well, President Obama has been warning that the $85 billion in automatic cuts would put thousands out of work and cause damage to the U.S. economy. The last thing you want to see is Washington get in the way of progress. Unfortunately, uh, in just four days, Congress is poised to allow a series of arbitrary automatic budget cuts to kick in that will slow our economy, eliminate good jobs, and leave a lot of folks who are already pretty thinly stretched, uh, scrambling to figure out what to do. Thousands of teachers and educators will be laid off. Tens of thousands of parents will have to deal with finding childcare for their children. Hundreds of thousands of Americans will lose access to primary care and preventive care like flu vaccinations and cancer screenings. Uh, tomorrow, for example, I'll be in the Tidewater region of Virginia, uh, where workers will sit idle when they should be repairing ships and a carrier sits idle when it should be deploying to the Persian Gulf. Now, these impacts will not all be felt on day one, uh, but rest assured the uncertainty is already having an effect. Companies are preparing layoff notices. Families are preparing to cut back on expenses. And the longer these cuts are in place, the bigger the impact will become. Well, I spoke to the executive director of the National Priorities Project, Joe Comerford, and asked what practical effects these cuts could have. Sequestration affects primarily the discretionary portion of the budget, which is roughly one-third of the projected fiscal year 2013 budget. Um, and in that budget, uh, in that discretionary budget, are things like education, uh, Title I, Head Start, some Pell Grant funding, community college funding, uh, funding for work with disabled students, also health care, uh, community um, health centers, other kinds of public health programs, also infrastructure, roads, bridges, IT networks, also energy in the environment, renewable energy research and development, national parks, uh, clean water, clean air work at the state and national level. So it's a lot of what we think of when we think of federal budget spending in our midst, in our local communities. Also, uh, community development block grants. That kind of uh, grant funding comes directly into cities for large capital programs, like the repair of affordable housing stock, or for curb cuts, or for clean water purification treatment systems. Big ticket items that cities can't afford to pay in this era of fis fiscal un uh, turbulence. So talk to me a little bit about how ordinary Americans might see this play out in their cities and hometowns. I mean, does this mean that suddenly children could show up at school and they no longer have a teacher or uh, you know give me some examples of what we could be seeing here well it's a very good question this 85 billion that's mandated under sequestration uh, to take effect on March 1st of course it's going to take some time to be implemented so we won't as Americans see this happening overnight um, we might see slowdowns. Uh, we might see uh, teachers or spaces in schools not rehired. We might see planning for the next year uh, for larger class sizes. And in some cases, we will see um, potential layoffs, either in the public or private sectors, depending on um, how much cash there is available to uh, cushion some of the drawdown in spending. Um, what's really at, at um, at issue here is the long-term effect of sequestration. $85 billion out of a relatively small piece of the overall budget pie will be felt uh, split between domestic and uh, military programs over time. Uh, so 
what will start out as more chaos or government by crisis or tension uh, or slowdowns um, will end up being real teachers, um, real public uh, furloughs, fur furloughs of public servants, um, fewer air traffic controllers, fewer construction jobs. But we don't like see that. a lot of public outcry, do we? I mean, why are there not more Americans standing up and saying this must be stopped? Well, you know, the Pew Research Center just issued a poll, and it's actually a very important litmus test. It said actually that the majority of Americans don't understand what's happening right now. Uh, and I would imagine that that's one of the major um, aspects of why we're not seeing more public outrage. Uh, and part of that is that we've had protracted budget battles in Washington. Right, right now, as we're about to feel the impact of sequestration, we don't have a fiscal year 13 budget, nor do we have a proposed 14. And we've had something called the debt crisis in our midst since really 2011. So I think actually Americans don't understand it, um, which is do they do they I, I not think understand a real corrosive it? element. Do, do they not understand it, or do they think that it's not really going to happen? I think it's a mixture of both. And certainly, actually, I think you get at a good point, which is we've had a lot of false starts coming out of Washington. So Americans could think, oh, boy, this is a lot of smoke and mirrors. But really, I'm going to go to bed on um, you know, the end of February. I'm going to wake up on March 1st, and not a whole lot's going to change. Therefore, I believe that Americans aren't necessarily keeping up with the details, in part because they're complicated, in part because there haven't been enough details till this very moment. Well, for more on this, I am joined in the studio by Republican strategist John Fury and from Madison, Wisconsin, John Nichols is Washington correspondent for The Nation. Gentlemen, welcome. Before we begin, I want to take a look at exactly how it is that Washington finds itself in this place once again. Well, now these impending cuts date back to 2011 when they were passed as part of the Budget Control Act that year. Now, they were intended to be incentive for a dedicated congressional committee to come up with a deal to cut at least $1.2 trillion from the budget over 10 years. But that didn't happen. The cuts were then supposed to come into effect at the beginning of 2013. But together with the expiration of some tax cuts, their impact on the economy would likely have thrown the United States into recession. So at the last minute, Congress reached a deal to push the sequester cuts to March the 1st. So John, I wanted to start with you. Well, actually, I've got two Johns here today. I'll start with John Nichols in Madison, Wisconsin first. You know, it seems like we have been here before because we have. I mean, talk to me a little mm -hmm. bit about whether there was ever the sense in Washington that there was even an attempt to try and resolve some of this so that we didn't get to the same sort of crisis with the clock ticking away? Well, I'm afraid this isn't just an American problem. Countries all over the world are wrestling with these austerity debates. The question of whether you're going to balance your budget with cuts, trying to cut your way to prosperity, versus the notion that uh, you might try to grow your way to prosperity. And there are deep, deep divisions between Democrats and Republicans on these issues. And the fact of the matter is, when they cut the deal back in 2011, there was a political underpinning for it. Both sides presumed that they would eventually win a, a clear majority, a clear governing position in the 2012 election. So effectively, they each decided to stand down and wait to see how the 2000 election played out, and then whoever was in charge would be able to sort things out. As it happened, we ended up with more divided government, as, same thing we had in 2011, little bit stronger for the Democrats, but not sufficient to give them full governing power. And so we end up in exactly the same place that we were in. And the sad part about it is that this isn't gonna finish on March 1. No matter what happens March 1, this wrestling between two very, very different visions for where the country ought to go uh, will continue because we have divided government. So, so John Ferry, talk to me a little bit about how we could see this play out on the ground then. I mean, we keep being told this is going to be chaos. We hit a deadline. It moves a little further. We don't see the chaos and the dire consequences that we were told were going to happen. How is this going to play out this time, or will this time be any different? Well, there's a couple of things that are coming up. First, you're going to have at the end of March, 
uh, this continuing resolution that keeps the government operating is going to expire. So re uh, Republicans and Democrats have to come together before that date runs out and decide how they want to proceed with governing for the 2013 fiscal year. I think what they're going to end up doing is coming up with a solution that keeps to the numbers of their sequester but allows the uh, different agencies to to not use the blunt instrument of a sequester, but uh, you do use their own kind of discretion to cut spending where they want. In May, you're going to see us come up against the debt limit again. And so they have to make another decision as to whether uh, Republicans and Democrats could come together to agree on a bigger package, uh, which would include entitlement cuts and perhaps other revenues, and to deal with that next uh, debt limit so we don't default on our debt. And then throughout all of this, you're going to have both Republicans and Democrats, and the Republicans in the House, Democrats in the Senate, come up with their own blueprints for the 2014 budget. As John said, there are two completely different visions of how to go, and somehow both sides have to reconcile these visions because if they don't reconcile the visions, they're going to be pox on both their houses and voters are going to throw everybody out. Well, and I think when, when voters finally or Americans see the, the sort of these things turn into not just uh, political talk, but actual tangible things on the ground that are going to be taken away, then I think it might start to sink in. I want to take a look again at some of those things that could be cut. Now, if Congress doesn't act, the approximately $85 billion in cuts for the rest of 2013 will take place on Friday. Now, most parts of the government will be affected. Half those cuts, just more than $42 billion, will be to defense, which will mean reduced maintenance on ships, aircraft, and buildings, and which defense contractors say will force them to lay off thousands of workers. Now, the other half will be for domestic programs, food inspection programs, uh, programs for the mentally ill, education programs, and even transportation could be affected. Now, the Federal Aviation Authority says it's facing $600 million in cuts, which it says will affect the number of air traffic controllers and maintenance staff it will have at airports and it will even cause delays in flight times. 70,000 children will lose access to Head Start. That is an early learning program for low-income children. And if Congress doesn't reach a deal, automatic spending cuts of some $1 trillion will take place over the next 10 years, meaning even deeper cuts to both defense and domestic programs. So, so John uh, Nichols, talk to me a little bit about you know, the fact that we've got here, I mean, we have to remind our viewers that this was never supposed to happen. When this came up, when this deal was struck in 2011, these cuts were supposed to be so draconian in nature that it would force the White House and Congress to work together. Uh, what happened? Well, what has happened is that both the Congress and the White House on one side and the American people on the other have frankly gotten very, very used to this uh, kind of rolling crisis. And it is important to understand what we've seen over the last four or five years. We've seen changes of government that have gone to overwhelming Democratic control, then big Republican victory, then in 2012, essentially a very good-sized Democratic victory. We have seen through that all uh, fiscal cliffs and debt ceiling debates. We've seen the bond uh, rating agencies shift the rating for the U.S. Uh, we've seen more uh, challenges, fights, budget battles. And I think m people in Washington and around the country have begun to, to believe that this is all sort of a theater, that it plays out uh, like a game and everybody positions and yells and screams, but not a lot happens. What is going to occur on March 1, if it plays out as is predicted, uh, will be the point at which people who thought they were watching this theater now understand it's their life. And this may be, I'm not saying for sure, but it could be the first point at which Americans actually wake up to the reality that they're, they're in the midst of something very, very serious here. That could have a very revolutionary, I don't mean violent, I mean you know, just in a, in a sense of consciousness, could have a very revolutionary impact on how the public feels about all of these debates. And I have a feeling that there are some people in Washington on both sides that are sort of ready for that. They want people to start to take this more seriously in you, hopes you that that will help to resolve the differences. You certainly get that feeling, John Ferry, that in fact, um, members of Congress are almost sitting back waiting for that public outcry, almost wanting this deadline to pass and some of this to take place. 
Well, there's no doubt. I think that Republicans especially would like to see these cuts go into place because they want to cut the, the size and scope of, of the government. They believe that government can take a haircut. They believe that 5% is not too much to ask from a government that has expanded uh, enormously over the last five, five years, as uh, oh, spending has doubled over the last 10 years. And you know, for, for a lot of Republicans, they think, hey, enough's enough. Now, I think from- Even this, if this includes defense especially, spending. Especially, well, especially defense spending. I mean, you know- But that uh, has Bob, always been something uh, Bob that Gates, Republicans Bob, are protected. Well, I know, but Bob Gates, uh, the former Secretary of Defense, used to tell a story about how uh, he would uh, have to rake his own leaves, and the generals living next door would have someone rake his leaves for him, and so he would throw the leaves over on, on the generals. I mean, the fact of the matter is that there's tons of spending to be cut in the Def Defense Department. We all know that. There's, there's a time for everybody to, to tighten their belt. I know that there's a lot of maintenance and things that have to happen, and some people might lose their jobs, but there's been a, an aggressive uh, uh, increase in spending in every uh, proportion of government, and it's time for, I think Republicans especially feel this, it's time for them to take it down a notch, cut spending, and this is only the biggest, the, the first part. I think for other, other Republicans, they believe that we need to somehow get to entitlement spending, which is the real driver of our debt. And if we can force the president, from the Republican standpoint, if they can force the president to the negotiating table and get a deal on entitlement spending, because this is a, some stress on the discretionary budget, which has been under stress for quite a long time, that this, the entitlement spending is, has got to be dealt with in, in some sort of a bigger budget deal. Well, John Nichols, when we heard President Obama speaking to the governors on Monday, he certainly was throwing it back at Congress, saying it was Congress that needed to find the compromise. Mm -hmm. But when you hear John Fury speaking, it seems that the, the problem is the White House, that it doesn't want to touch some of that entitlement spending that they feel is the big problem. Well, it, it's, I'd actually put it in a different perspective. Uh, the fact is that President Obama has on several occasions suggested that he was open to some significant entitlement reform, including change CPI, which is uh, a term that refers to getting rid of a lot of the cost of living increases for seniors living on our national pension program, which is called Social Security. Um, I would suggest that it is not so much Obama versus Congress as it is Washington folks who want to make cuts versus a American people who don't like to pay taxes and they don't like debts, but they absolutely do not want to see cuts in those entitlement programs. And this gets to the heart of the matter. Polling suggests that in some cases, some of these proposed entitlement cuts are opposed by as much as 89% of the American people. So nine out of 10 people that you run into don't want the cuts. And that creates a huge problem for Washington. That's why we're ending up in these silly sequester fights because um, you know, nobody actually wants to be responsible for doing the cuts. And I think that, that that's where we're gonna get to the, the heart of the matter. Well, one of do those we governors- Do we do entitlement okay. cuts or do we do uh, revenue increases, which is of course closing loopholes and taxing wealthy people? Well, one of those governors who was in Washington was Bobby Jindal, who did have some comments, not surprisingly. Uh, what he felt and where he felt some of the problem was, he pointed squarely at the president. You know, the state governors were from across the, the United States at the White House on Monday, and that's where President Obama was speaking. And as they pushed Congress to avert the federal spending cuts that are scheduled, as we pointed out, to take effect on Friday, speaking after they met with President Obama, Republican Bobby Jindal blamed the president for not taking action. Why don't you take a listen to this? For them to suggest that this will result in the hollowing out of the military, the you know the interruptions of food inspections, and it'll result in folks not getting critical health care services is, again, preposterous. I think it is up to the president to show leadership, to go to Congress and show how he can achieve these reductions by making prioritized reductions, protecting critical services. I think the American people know there's at least 3% of wasteful spending in the federal government, that these kinds of reductions can be made without jeopardizing national security. These kinds of reductions can be made without jeopardizing food inspections or, or critical health care services. John Nichols, I want to quickly bring you in and ask you about that soundbite there because, you know, you sort of suggest this could be the start of something revolutionary. But when you hear Bobby Jindal, it, uh, it sounds, you know, from at least that Republican standpoint that, in fact, there's still a lot of finger pointing and name calling going on. It doesn't feel like a lot has changed. No, it's not, the politicians aren't going to change. It's really whether the people decide to put immense pressure on these politicians. You know, Bobby Jindal's approval rating in, in Louisiana is now down to about 37%. Uh, he's significantly less popular in his own state than the president is nationally. And so 
I, I think that Jindal is not somebody I would listen to particularly seriously on this. I would note that a number of Republican governors have come across the aisle and uh, begun to put pressure on Republican members of Congress to move a bit on this thing. Because one thing to understand is the real hurt, if this happens, will not be felt in Washington. Not nearly so much as it will be felt in the cities and the states. And not only in the public sector, you will also start to see, if this goes forward, if these cuts go forward, you'll start to see a slowing of the economy. Job cuts and a real slowing of growth. And that's going to hurt every governor and every mayor. And do you think, John Ferry, that when that starts to happen, when these ripple effects are felt outside of Washington, that that's when you'll start to see both sides, maybe not adhering to their political stripes, but to actually genuinely looking at compromise when they're getting the phone calls from constituents who are saying, you know, my child doesn't have a school bus driver or I can't get the health care I need. Well, I, I don't think you're going to see uh, people uh, complaining about uh, school bus drivers. All that's funding, and most of that funding is done at the local level. I mean, what, what you're going to see here, and you've seen it right now, with a lot of Republican governors saying, you know, let's fix this problem because not only do they have a lot of, uh, get a lot of money from the federal government, they also get a lot of mandates. So what the, a lot of these governors will also ask for is, if you're not going to give me the money, give me the opportunity to get out of these mandates and spend the money as I see fit. Um, you know, we'll see how much of an impact this actually has on the economy. It's $85 billion. We have a, a more than a $3 trillion economy. Now, Wall Street doesn't believe that this is a big deal. They, they're they almost at the, at the highest levels they've been in five years. If, if they thought this had a catastrophic economic impact, they would have uh, built this into their their their. their so, so if Wall up. Street doesn't care, why should the American people Well, care? I'm not sure if they should care that much. I mean, I think that it will have uh, some impact, but I don't think it's going to be as dramatic. It'll have a bigger impact inside the Beltway. It's going to have a definite impact in Northern Virginia and Maryland and, and Washington, D.C. I think it'll emanate out slowly but surely, uh, but it's not going to be as big as, as, as you think. And, yeah, some people might have to be furloughed. Uh, and I think that for a lot of uh, Republicans, they're, they're going to want to deal with this, but I don't think they're going to want to wiggle away too much from these cuts. They've promised and campaigned on the a mantra of cut spending. Well, the spending cuts are here. If they if they try to to, to uh, wriggle away from that uh, at the end, they're they're going to be con uh, angering a lot of their own base constituents. But is this any way to govern? I mean, this seems like governing by crisis. Well, you know, mm -hmm. we have two stark philosophies, uh, and it's it's a far superior way to govern than to have open warfare. It's a far a superior way to govern than almost any other. It's a lousy way to govern, but it's better than anything else. And the fact of the matter is. The only time you get to compromise in a divided government sometimes is when you have a deadline, and sometimes these deadlines are precipitated crisis. I would say that all these crises, as John pointed out, have been overblown. We have not had uh, the end of the world happen. Uh, and if you look at what's happened in Europe, I think well, we've managed our crises better than they've managed their crises. And so, you know, things don't look that, that great, but they're not that bad. Well, John Nichols, I mean, John Ferry brings up a good point. You know, European governments have certainly had to face austerity. Is it that the United States mm -hmm. just has a bit of an aversion to this and it, it's, it's the U.S.'s turn? No, we've been smarter. Look, the fact of the matter is that The Economist magazine, The Financial Times, hardly left-wing publications, both say that austerity has been especially destructive to growth in Europe. In fact, uh, many, many European conservatives point to the United States model as a much more effective one. The United States going with a growth and investment approach, the stimulus, rather than cut, cut, cut. So the but fact of the matter is that we are now debating taking an idea that has failed elsewhere and forcing it on the U.S. economy. Austerity is a bad idea if you want to grow your economy. And I, I don't disagree with that. And I think that Republicans have a different view of how to get away from austerity, which is tax cuts. They are much more tax cut oriented. The, the Democrats are much more oriented towards towards increasing spending, which the Democrat, the Republicans don't like so much. So we do have these contract. You know, Barack Obama wants to raise taxes. Uh, Republicans want to cut spending. Both of them are kind of balanced approaches their own way, and they, the conflicting philosophies have kind of led to a gridlock. Which and the gridlock has actually been kind of the the in many ways the best of both worlds. You so haven't, 30 seconds left. Are we going to see a deal before Friday? Or is there a little we're not going to see a deal before Friday. That's not going to happen, but we might see a deal before the end of March. John Nichols? John and I disagree on many things, but I think we might agree on that one. All right, gentlemen, we are going to leave it there. John Nichols, John Fury, we appreciate you joining us here on Inside Story Americas. 
And that is all from the team in Washington, D.C. for now. But I want to remind you, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Facebook. That is where you can find more information about our program. We want to hear from you. So tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas to us directly here at InsideStory at aljazeera.net. Thanks for watching Inside Story America.